Um, hi, uh, I'm Tof Allen. I'm an epidemiologist and, uh, I guess, director of data science on EcoHealth Alliance's technology and data team. Um, and I'm excited to be here talking to you all. I'm going to try and go pretty quickly because I went over in one of my rehearsals. Um, so EcoHealth Alliance is a New York-based nonprofit, and we um, do research at kind of the intersection of public health and conservation, uh, mostly studying emerging infectious diseases. And we're a big multidisciplinary organization with field ecologists, um, public health specialists, um, and you know, a modeling and analytics team, and then this software team that I kind of co-steer. Co um, and uh, yeah, I'm, our team works largely on um, machine learning applications for biosurveillance, um, but we're interested in data integration too. Um, so I'm going to hit on data sharing and data integration and kind of what that is, talk a bit about tabular metadata and ontologies, and then talk about what, we're, what this proposal that we're submitting um, is about. So data sharing is, um, is going way up, and this is a good thing. Um, I went and looked at this 2014 blog post um, on the R OpenSide blog. And so this is the number of packages on the Dryad repository. Um, and these are packages, data sets with associated papers. Um, and uh, yeah, they're going way up. And this blog post was in 2014. So yesterday, um, I went back and looked. And there are a lot more now. It's, it's increasingly becoming the norm to share your scientific data publicly, and this is driven by a bunch of different factors, uh, including uh, good infrastructure built up around hosting data in repositories, and the growth of data sharing mandates from publishers and funders, etc. And um, in a scientific context, you know, open data is a, is a really good thing. Um, a lot of its value derives from the ability to you know, join multiple data sets together, uh, meaning that you can uh, run comparisons or meta-analyses or you know, studies with greater power because you can have new data sets or add other variables. Um, and on a more philosophical level, I guess it means that um, it would be nice if data is all going into this kind of shared, big shared effort. But um, that's not, not really the case as it stands. Um, because just because data is available doesn't mean that it's integrable. Um, I saw a really good breakdown once about the barriers uh, to data integration, um, and uh, that defined them as you need to have stuff in the same place. And so this is kind of a problem that's solved with you know, data sharing being uh, such a big thing now. Um, you need to have your information in the same structure. So this is file format. Um, this is, you know, is it aggregated to the same level? And then you need to have the same thing um, described in, in the same language. Um, so semantic incompatibility is uh, kind of a big sticking point. Um, and what, what semantic incompatibility basically refers to is you have something, say, this island here, and you have a ton of different ways that you could refer to it. You might have um, an official or a short name in the same language. You might have different languages. You might have a set of um, one of many types of standard codes. Um, you could have some proprietary codes or a set of coordinates, or even just a reference to a shapefile on a hard drive. And this uh, leads to some, I guess, anti-patterns in, in data analysis. So say you have a bunch of country-level indicators that you need to run analysis of, and they're from different organizations. You know, they might, they might look similar, but you wind up having a fair amount of fairly messy, fairly ugly spaghetti code to get them to work together, and then you wind up writing function to score how good a match different things are. And then when you have another project using the same indicators, you tell your research assistants, no, don't go download these. Just use the script I wrote to merge these before, because it works. So thinking about the barriers to data integration and the solutions, um, you've got the data availability um, problem um, solved in data agreements and ways to transport files around. You have the structure problem solved by the growth of um, software ecosystems and practices for tidy data, essentially, which make that much easier to reconcile. And the way that you get around semantic incompatibility is annotate your tabular data with links to ontologies, because then you can integrate your data set through ontologies. So 
just so we're on the same page, when I say ontology, I'm referring to like a structured dictionary that documents um, meaning in a, in a certain domain. Um, so say I'm an ornithologist, and I'm collecting sightings of swans in a CSV file, um, and they're tidy um, sightings, I guess, by day. Um, and I want to integrate another data set that another researcher um, created. And this, as you can see, in these two data sets, the swan species are referred to differently. Um, and you don't want to just rename them because you know that's not going to generalize. Um, so if you go and found, if you went and found a, an ontology of swans, you might want to call it a swantology. Um, <laughs> and and you, uh, you annotate your data, linking it to the swan ontology. Well, then after you've done that, um, that's the hard part. After you have that link there, conceptually at least, it would be relatively simple to get your data to work together. Um, and to actually get this to happen, a lot of the pieces that you would need are in place. Um, so you have your, your there are standards um, published by the web consortium the, about how to represent tabular data and metadata. Um, and, and in fact, this particular standard, uh, CSV on the web, um, one of the editors of the spec uh, named Jenny Tennyson gave a presentation at last year's CSV conf about that. Um, one of the ways that this defines um, to uh, encode your metadata is to have your CSV file and to have a sidecar metadata file. And this degrades nicely because if you don't have the software to read the metadata file, you still at least have a CSV. And the metadata file is in JSON for linked data. So where a plain JSON file would just have a bunch of data in it, um, JSON LD um, gives that data, but also links to a schema that says what you're meant to expect, um, what the structured bits of, what the bits of data and what they should look like. Um, so JSON, LD, and CSV on the web are part of the semantic web set of standards. There are a bunch of these. Um, RDF schema is another one. And this family of standards also includes a way to publish ontologies, which are key. Um, so OWL, Web Ontology Language, is already used by groups like BioPortal, which is a project of the National Center for Bioontology and Stanford University. Um, this is a centralized ontology, uh, I guess, repository. Um, it focuses on very broadly defined biomedical ontologies. So this is, includes, um, you know, cancer terminology, but also place names. Um, and a sister project, the Center for Extended Data Annotation and Retrieval, they're working on tools, uh, including sort of like metadata recommenders, um, which, and they're mostly focused on laboratory data. So data repositories like Data One are also part of the kind of data sharing boom, and they have support for a number of these kind of ontology and linked data standards. And they also have some interfaces that can help create them. Um, both, both CEDA and Data One are researching ways um, to predict structured metadata from unstructured metadata. So say you have a textual description of a file or a paper accompanying a file, um, they're uh, working on ways to try and predict um, what ontology you might need to describe different bits of the file. And they have some preliminary interface that's available on their website um, and on GitHub. But despite all this, um, despite the proliferation of standards and tools, there's something missing because very few data sets have structured metadata still. Um, so these are two papers that if you're interested in this, I recommend. They're both from 2011. Um, and they, one is a survey of, of scientists and another is, um, I guess, an ethnographic study of a bunch of research sites which are implementing ecological metadata language. Um, I guess I would sum up their takeaway points by saying that many, if not most scientists, at least you know, six years ago, um, are unaware of metadata and metadata standards if uh, there are tools to apply them and what the potential benefits of metadata would be. And even for metadata savvy scientists, Annotation is, is time consuming at best or impossible at worst because there aren't really many tools available to perform it. And even when metadata is properly applied, it doesn't really provide any immediate payoff to that workflow because again, you're missing the tooling. 
Um, it's most likely uses um, for future projects, um, other people, and yeah, I'll let you read this quote. And so the compounding uh, uh, factors, I guess I would say, a lot of annotation when it does happen, happens when you're getting ready to archive your data. So at the end of a project, you're getting ready to upload to a repository and publish a paper. And um, this, means, this means that scientists aren't likely to use metadata-driven tools during the course of their research. Um, they... Uh, I guess it also means that decisions about you know, how you're going to structure your data or errors that you make will accumulate over the course of a project, which means that when you actually go to apply metadata using the tools provided by repositories, it's, it's harder. And it also happens as you know, you're scrambling to get stuff ready or you're shifting resources to your next project. And uh, yeah, it just, even a mandate's not going to help at this point. So, that's where we are right now, and this project, this proposal that we've, um, I guess we're in the process of submitting to the Sloan Foundation is about a set of tools that we're, we want to develop um, to kind of bring an annotation forward in a project's lifespan. Because um, we figure that with the right set of tools, you can reduce the effort and increase the incentive for scientists to annotate their data, and uh, I guess at the same time, reduce workload and bring a bunch of those benefits um, that open data promises. So there are two major parts um, to our, our plan, I guess. The first is, you know, we want to take our, our own shot at creating a me metadata recommendation service um, using machine learning and, a, and heuristic approaches that we've used in, in other projects that we've done. And uh, we also want to create interfaces, graphical and command line interfaces that make it easier to apply metadata early in a data set's life cycle um, and make it easier to get some utility out of that metadata, um, kind of have this um, virtuous cycle, uh, bring it forward, like lower the barrier and uh, increase the incentives. So with a metadata recommender service, what we'd want to do is um, predict the metadata for a CSV file and do so in a kind of a two-step thing. First, you want to predict the column level ontology, and then second, you want to predict, predict the cell level value. Um, and you, we are going to try and do so based only on the contents of the table itself. So we don't really want to rely on a paper having been written because um, otherwise it's not going to be useful for a random CSV file sitting around on someone's hard drive. So essentially, we want something that could, oh, skip. yeah, we want something that can prioritize um, amongst different ontologies and uh, at least produce recommendations. And you know, have this package be something with, uh, you know, usable API so that it can be um, useful even if the rest of the project sputters, because uh, you know that's good stuff. And. Um, we want to, you know, train it on. There's a bunch of existing data out there, which uh, kind of in the wild, which might be useful for this. So data one is already doing research into this sort of thing, and they're already working on a recommender. And we were chatting with um, someone from data one, who's I forget who it was, but anyway, um, they pointed us to a, a repo that's linked here, and um, they have a thousand data sets, I think it is, which are manually annotated specifically for the purpose of training these sort of algorithms. Now, a lot of their approaches um, are getting pretty poor predictive power right now, and there's no reason to think that you know, we're going to have a silver bullet or do a better job than they are, um, which is why I think the interface part is really key. Because good interfaces can make a really poorly predictive algorithm useful if it streamlines the process of kind of triaging um, recommendations. And also, if you hook it up right, you can set up, again, a kind of a virtuous cycle where you're um, creating, using kind of less good algorithms to create training data to make better algorithms. So, um, this is uh, our tech team's main software projects kind of have done, done this, but in a different field. So, 
We're working on um, this piece of software called IDA Connect, which is the Emerging Infectious Disease Repository. And it's kind of doing knowledge-based population um, backed by machine learning and natural language processing. And so it'll take text, identify case and death counts, and use those plus identified place names and dates to populate um, this schema for a spatiotemporal um, disease event. But since you know, we don't have training data to make it a spot on 100% of the time right algorithm, we worked really hard to get this interface where a user can triage um, the suggested annotations, and then we save that data in a way that it can be used by classifiers um, for kind of the next round of updates. I think the interface is also important to give the user, especially a non-technical user, um, a really clear mental model of what's going on. Um, and here's that virtuous cycle I was talking about. The graphical interface and the R package are also a good place for us to surface some of the useful functionality, which I think m properly annotated metadata uh, would provide. So writing out sidecar metadata files is a great thing because other tools which write, um, which read and write data in these standards can then make use of that. Um, I imagine you'd also want to be able to write out like a canonicalized version of a CSV file. Um, it would make it much easier to um, submit your data to a repository so there's not that mad dash at the end of a project. And we could also um, provide um, verbs to operate on tables based on the semantic annotations for the metadata. So um, like a, a left join based on the ontological value of your country column as opposed to the string value. Then we have our continuous integration setup, which Noam has been, been a big proponent of. Um, and I think this is the part he's most excited about. Um, so the, uh, the continuous integration um, idea is essentially you set the, uh, set the software, set the service to monitor a certain folder, maybe in, in GitHub or Dropbox. Um, and the web service, when it uh, sees a change in, in the data file there, um, pulls up a report and maybe it emails you or, or could do a number of other things. So it could automatically write back metadata files um, with recommendations above a certain confidence threshold or alert a user um, or give you nice little badges to put on a GitHub repository. Essentially, I think where we want to see metadata go in the next five years is to take it from the mad dash mandated task at the end of a project to be part of the procrastination, yak shaving setup phase at the beginning of a project. <laughs> so to caveat this, this is just a proposal. We haven't done this yet, um, but I, I, I think this is where it, the field is going to go. And there are definitely other people working on similar projects. Um, and you know, we're super interested in collaborating in, on this sort of thing. Um, another caveat. In this talk and in our proposal, we're intentionally punting on some of the details. I, I'm kind of being glib. We're really defining stuff as out of scope because it gets really technical um, really quickly and a very layered problem. And I think we're trying to focus, to narrow our scope um, in a way to uh, tackle a little bit at a time. So I guess I want to thank Noam, who has been a great help um, kind of crystallizing a lot of my thoughts around this. Um, and it's great to have a multidisciplinary place to work at. The Sloan Foundation hasn't funded us, but they've done a bunch of great things. And uh, it's nice to have an organization to pitch this sort of thing to. And also, um, it's really lovely to have a conference like this and an audience who's willing to come listen to me nerd out about stuff like this. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. <laughs>